So hello, Elliot. It's very good to see you again. Today we'll speak about philosophical health and philosophical counseling, something that we both know because we practice it. Uh, and perhaps for the people who are looking at us, uh, we should present ourselves briefly and uh, please start, Elliot, tell us a little bit about your uh, journey and, and what, what you do as a philosophical counselor. Well, journey-wise, uh, I began as um, an analytic uh, philosopher uh, and studied at Brown under Rod Chisholm, uh, which is, uh, for those out in philosophy land, are aware that he's, a, he's an extremely analytical uh, sort of philosopher who, who very much comes up with definitional schemata to define terms in a very tight, logical fashion. And so that's how I was raised. And uh, I, I don't regret that uh, because uh, as I got into the muck and mire of, of, of practicality, teaching students and the like, uh, it became evident that I needed to make what I was doing relevant you know, to ordinary life. And so I became an analytic applied philosopher. And uh, that, um, that took me further and further into the area of praxis where I got, got interested also in continental philosophy as well, broadened my horizon there and um, became very much interested in where uh, philosophy could help people grapple with problems of ordinary life. And um, that was where I started to uh, look at, at um, some aspects of, of psychology as well and got involved with um, uh, rational motor behavior therapy. In fact, I was working on a book um, on uh, values, and uh, my wife, who was, a, was, a, who was then in graduate school going for, for therapy, uh, suggested to me that um, uh, my work seemed very much akin to uh, Albert Ellis, the, um, the psychologist who started cognitive behavior therapy. So I, I looked into his work. I got certified in rational motor behavior therapy therapy, which was what he was uh, famous for, and, um, and got to know him. And um, so I worked with him for many years on, until his death in 2007. We became good friends and associates, and he supported my work, and I was sort of his on-call philosopher. And uh, we, um, you know, uh, understood, you know, that the importance of, of, of philosophy. He was coming at it from a psycho psychologist's perspective, I from a, from a philosopher's perspective, and uh, that's how logic-based therapy came into being, uh, which is the form of philosophical counseling that, um, that I do. And uh, it's, uh, I teach uh, it to students as well as train um, philosophers around the world you know, in, in the techniques of uh, philosophical counseling, specifically logic-based therapy. Uh, so that, that can give you an idea of uh, you know, my, my you know, my journey, <laughs> at least. <laughs> right. Yeah, so that's interesting because you were mentioning a, a sort of a conjunction between um, psychology and philosophy. Yeah. And, and I also encountered the two in the sense that, I mean, I, I was always more of a philosopher by training but i had the luck also or i mean it was it was an intentional luck to be trained into lacanian psychoanalysis uh, but for some reasons i felt that the uh, psychological and psychoanalytical practices today um, although very interesting and useful also have a tendency to fall in forms of uh, dogmatism of, or, or, or rigid thinking, which might be useful uh, in some contexts, but didn't correspond, let's say, to my uh, sensitivity. Uh, so I am a person for whom the, uh, the process philosophical concept of creativity is very important. And so I, uh, I wanted a practice that would be open to that 
form of deep listening to the singularity of each person. And that's how I started uh, after my, my PhD uh, in philosophy. That's how I started uh, practicing as a philosophical counselor um, in a way that was probably less organized than yours. Uh, I was actually uh, discovering my method um, as I was going, which perhaps I shouldn't say because it sounds a little bit like I was uh, using people as guinea pigs, right? But actually, it I, I, I did my best first to listen and to give them this opening to this sort of um, creative agency. But then I do agree that there is a step where it's very much also about the coherence between uh, not only our acts and our thoughts, which would say, I'd say it's an ethical issue, but also between our thoughts and other of our thoughts, which then can be a logical issue in the sense that we might sometimes contradict ourselves, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, the concept of contradiction, I think, is, is, is very important. Uh, in in logic-based therapy, essentially, um, through clinical work uh, and, and studies, uh, I've, I've found that uh, the, behind most um, behavioral and mental, mental uh, emotional issues are, are inconsistencies, conflicts going on. And they're, they're, they're both logical and, and, and behavioral. Uh, and, and affective as well. Um, what happens is that uh, many people uh, demand perfection. And, you know, I, I, I must be perfect. I must achieve. Uh, I must not make mistakes. Um, I must get the approval of others. Uh, I must be in control of, of, of my life and, and, and prevent bad things from happening. And, uh, but the reality is that you really you can't always do that, you know. So you you have um, logic-based therapy looks at the the reasoning process and the premises, you know, that um, that people have. On the one hand, uh, I I must be in control, uh, but then there's the empirical observation. Well, I'm not. You see, and and so you you run up against this this conflict, uh, really an inconsistency, you know, that that I must. But I, 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 it's not possible, you see. Uh, I must be certain, but I only have probability. Uh, and uh, as, as a result of that, um, it feels threatening. So the affect here is a product, you know, of that, that threatening-ness. And, and, it, and it's, it goes into the uh, phenomenology of, of this as, aspect as well, because when you're, when you, when you're demanding uh, that you know you have certainty, for instance, it's it's not just linguistic. In fact, there's a pre-linguistic step there where you just you feel uncomfortable about the fact that you only have probability. Uh, it, it is, it is a felt sense of necessity, and that's what generates this demand. So when you feel this necessity, but then you also feel this uneasiness because you don't have that necessity, uh, that generates further, you know, what, what interoceptive feelings, these are bodily feelings, even visceral gut feelings of, 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 of threateningness. And that threateningness uh, is, is what, you know, affects um, uh, not just the psyche, but the soma, you see, and people can suffer from all sorts of uh, physiological problems as a result of that. And this is what we call stress. And, uh, and that stress is unhealthy. See, so when we talk about philosophical health, philosophical health really cannot be dis divorced uh, from, from, this, from the psyche, you know, from, from the philosophical uh, welfare with your premises are in order. You have an appropriate view of reality. Uh, you don't demand perfection. You see things from perspectives that are consistent with physical prosperity as well as psychological prosperity. And, and philosophical constructs can be very useful. And for LBT, logic-based therapy, philosophical constructs that work, you know, are the ones that one adopts. So it's rather constructivistic as, as the 
um, rational behavior therapy from which it's derived uh, has been as well. And what works, you know, in, in terms of how you frame reality, what actually helps to promote uh, behavioral and emotional stability. Uh, and, and not every, every philosophical view is, is, is um, acceptable for everybody else. One size doesn't necessarily fit all. Right. And I think what we're going to talk about philosophical views and stances and, and, and how they uh, help us organize our lives, because I think what we have in common is that we do believe that philosophical health is something that is distinct, distinguishable from physical health uh, and from psychological health, especially in a, in a time where psychological health is seen more and more as a mechanistic construct, something that would be very dependent on the chemistry uh, of the brain, even perhaps sometimes uh, genetics. And so what we're saying is that, well, underlying our uh, decisions, which sometimes can seem very domestic in the sense that they are meant to organize our everyday life. In fact, they are, um, underlying ideologies, uh, thoughts, uh, recurrent thoughts, worldviews, and, and also probably also uh, political imperatives. Because when I hear you talk about the must, I think that, uh, and I'd like to have your opinion about it, but I think there is a want behind that. Right, say so I want to be in control, uh, and then how do we go from that want to the must? Is very interesting because I think one of the factors there is the 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 epoch of individualism in which we are. And you are living in the United States. I am living in Sweden. We could uh, also a bit later compare, uh, but let's say that in general, there is a global tendency now to uh, put on the individual the charge and responsibility for our own destiny. And that puts a lot of pressure also, right? Uh, to, and, and probably is, is a, a factor of this uh, in, that influences this idea that we must sometimes, we must be in control. We must be our own uh, little corporation of which we, we are the, the, the CEO, right? So how do we help people with those things? And so um, if I hear correctly, and, and, and I was uh, really... Um, intrigued and interested by your paper on perfectionism and the pandemic uh, in which you speak of um, uh, metaphysical security. That's intriguing. So what's the difference between metaphysical security and philosophical health? Well, uh Metaphysical security seems to be a, a necessary condition of philosophical health. A philosophical health um, could embrace um, other specific types of metaphysical security. So metaphysical security is pretty much an umbrella term because there's, there's many different types of metaphysical security. Security about yourself. Uh, in other words, you, you're it's okay for you to be imperfect, that um, you can make mistakes and you're still acceptable. Um, it's uh, okay for the world uh, to just have probability and not certainty. And in fact, you know, philosophically, you can reframe that and see that the world, you know, is 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 exciting by virtue of having probability. If everything was certain, then there would be no exploration. There would be no excitement and discovery uh, because it would all be already planned. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's, you know, there's, there's different aspects of, of um, metaphysical security. And really when you put them all together, they all contribute to philosophical health. 
philosophical health means that your, your underlying philosophies are promoting metaphysical security. So what is a philosophically healthy individual? It's, a, it's an individual who's, who looks at the world philosophically in a way that allows them uh, to be metaphysically secure. Uh, and, um, and, and, and so, you know, is, is uh, metaphysical security uh, necessary for philosophical? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically what philosophical uh, counseling and practice is aiming at. To, to promote, you know, metaphysical security. Mm. Yeah, I think there are two things here. Um, the first one is I, I think probably people need examples and we, we, we're going to come to that. Uh, but before that, I would like to say, I'd rather use personally the, the, the term possibility rather than probability. Uh, because I do think that we live in a world that is already very organized uh, into frames of analytic probability that are now uh, automated actually into um, uh, so-called artificial intelligence, which is not that intelligent by the way. But uh, so probability is, is quite mathematical. Possibility for me has more this sense of agency where you, and you quote that in your paper by uh, referring to Nietzsche, Nietzsche, right? The, the self-determination capacity for uh, an individual or a group to expand their domain of possibilities. And that being done, and this is, I think, our common thesis, that can be done uh, through thought, through uh, um, a sort of cognitive examination, but also cognitive creativity uh, on, on the system of belief that conducts our acts. Now, in terms of example, so, because I think metaphysical security is a little bit, the way I, I understand it, uh, it is, is a little bit comparable for me to what I call the second principle of philosophical health, which is deep orientation, which is the fact that, um, it is, and that can lead to excesses of perfectionism, right? But is that we are creatures of belief. Uh, even mathematics, even science relies on axiomatic beliefs. And so it is often uh, fruitful to conduct our life based on uh, some form of idealism. And you know that you don't necessarily like that term, right? But uh, let's say someone who would consider that um, justice, right, is her highest value. So that will give her some form of, of security because that's the kind of security a belief procures. And then of course, uh, in the application of that deep orientation, there can be a, a, a healthy way, right, which knows that, well, ideals are asymptotic, right? They are not something that eventually gets fully actualized. They are, they are limits in the horizon that we slowly approach, but we know that uh, we will never get to this pure absolute world uh, of justice, but we believe in it. That's the paradox of humanity, right? Uh, would you like to propose another example of uh, metaphysically secure uh, belief or, or, or conviction? Yeah, and, and to comment on your example, um, striving for justice, you could you can turn this into a rigid dogmatic demand to attain justice. And that would fly in the face of metaphysical security. You say metaphysical security would mean that you're secure in the fact that, you know, there's no end to striving for justice. You can get better and better. The world is open to improvement. Right. Always. And, um, and, and the fact that there isn't justice doesn't mean there can't be, you know, greater job, you know, mm. less injustice and right. greater justice, but, but being able to 
realize, you know, being, being comfortable with the idea that, that you're not going to achieve perfection, even in justice, is what we mean by metaphysical security. Mm. So that's where metaphysical security comes into play. Mm. Um, you know, in terms of other examples, um, there are many individuals, for instance, who before they do anything, they want to know if others will approve of them. They have to have the approval of others. And um, if, if indeed they, they don't get the approval of others, then they feel uncomfortable. And then they damn themselves. They feel themselves unworthy. Um, but a metaphysically secure individual would realize one doesn't always get the approval of others. Sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. Uh, that's part of reality. Mm. It's the comfort level with the idea that reality is has these imperfections and it's not necessarily a bad thing it's the way things are so understanding you know that this is reality not necessarily how it must be so we, we were able to you know compartmentalize this is and this must uh in a way that we feel comfortable Mm. And, you know, there's, there's different types of, I mentioned earlier, interceptive feelings. Um, there's deontological feelings, feelings like of a duty, you know, like this must in terms of a, a moral duty. So in, in terms of justice, one might have this deontological sense that nothing is, is good enough unless it's perfect, unless there's perfect justice in the world. And you, and you feel it, you know, when, when something is wrong, it feels uncomfortable. And there's that conflict that comes in because you realize that the world isn't, you know, always just, but that justice is something that should and, 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 and ought and must be, but you don't have it because you have a gap between those two things. Mm -hmm. And a metaphysically secure individual realizes that that gap is part of reality. And it is, you know, part of what one, uh, the price to be living in the world and living successfully in the world is to accept it, to embrace that insecurity and to strive for excellence, realizing that excellence and perfection are not the same thing. Right. But like, it's sort of a, some uh, people listening to you might wonder is that how do we go from, because at one, at some point, you, it seems that you're saying that uh, it, is it is philosophically healthy to be somewhat a relativistic, like not an absolutivistic, some, not someone that thinks uh, that, that believes that perfection can be attained. But how do we go from this sort of capacity to relativize to the idea that it's a metaphysical security. Are you elevating imperfection to an ontology? It's, it might seem like that. It might seem like you're saying, you know, it's, it's a sort of a Buddhism of imperfection, which I find interesting, right? Is is a sort of imperfection is perfection, or? <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, the title of uh, a recent book of mine is making peace with imperfection. Right. <laughs> so uh, in, in a way, yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty much the goal of, of metaphysical security to make peace mm. with imperfection. Right. Uh, and, and so is that, is that the idea? Well, yeah, but I mean, you, you don't wanna say we're glorifying imperfection in the sense that, um, you know, we're striving for imperfection. Right. <laughs> Right. We're striving you, right. to be better and better, but we, <laughs> right. we don't get there. It's okay. <laughs> mm. No, but I think one thing is interesting behind it. Idea, this idea is, uh, is that is to remember that perfection and imperfection are perspectives on the world. To use a, a Nietzschean concept, right? So there is not. I mean, in mathematics, if you say two plus two equal five, clearly there is an imperfection there that is related to a, a, a system of truth that is uh, more or less localized, although it can be applicable to many things. But uh, in philosophy and in everyday life, 
those are perfect per perspectives, right? What can be perfection for you can be imperfection for me, etc. So what what I see there as something that I I work uh, more and more uh, with my counselors is uh cognitive diversity is this idea that philosophical health is not normative in the sense that it would tell you how to think well uh what to believe in in order to have a philosophically healthy life but rather how to understand your own system of thoughts such that you're cap cap capable to mentalize the other's system of thought as potentially different. And this is something humans are so bad at doing, right? Uh, couples, for example, fight many times out of the fact that one thinks he is right and the other one also thinks he is right. And, and, and that's uh, political fights, etc. the list could go on forever. And I think that if we start paying attention to the possibility that different systems of thought, and that's more than a possibility, right? But I want to call it a possibility because, because of imperfection, precisely. It's not like I come with my perfectly rounded system and you come with your perfectly rounded system. No, we are... We are puzzle, ontological puzzles that work more or less, and we want to make them, of course, as clear and, and as coherent as possible. But uh, I think what this, uh, what this care for, uh, let's say for, I think perhaps we could call it quasi-perfection in the sense that we want to stay right beneath the limit where we start uh, wanting this full perfe perfection. That's also a care for the fact that all the ways of looking at the world are there and they might, might, might actually inspire us. Yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's an important point that um, there are alternative ways of fleshing out reality and not just our own, but others. And um, that's why logic-based therapy uh, has certain parameters within which we um, can attain uh, metaphysical uh, security and, 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 and uh, philosophical health. And, and that would involve, for instance, tolerance you know, for, for others. Uh, so what, what logic-based therapy does is introduce a set of, of um, guiding virtues, as it calls them, and these guiding virtues can be interpreted philosophically differently. So, you know, some people's way of, of, of understanding uh, tolerance is, is maybe Buddhistic. Another might be, you know, uh, pragmatic. Uh, there's, there's no limit to how you can frame, you know, these, these virtues, but those virtues are the, the aspirational goals to be more tolerant to be more um, empathetic. And, and I think in the cases that you, you've given, empathy is, is, is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, Logic-based therapy talks about certain cardinal fallacies that, that people uh, commit. Uh, and, and these are basically types of thinking or reasoning that have a proven track record of frustrating personal and interpersonal happiness. And so uh, one of them is uh, world revolves around me thinking. Uh, since this is quite relevant, I think, to what you're saying, what RAM thinking, which is uh, at its extreme, we have narcissistic personality disorders. Uh, and, and essentially, these are, are individuals who, who, who think that, you know, they are the authors of reality. You know, if, if, if they believe something is true, then others need to believe it because they're right and the others are wrong. And uh, when you have that kind of thinking going on, uh, you're, you're not going to have meaningful and prosperous relationships. Mm. Imagine two individuals <laughs> who are RAM thinkers go out on a date together. <laughs> How is that going to work? 
Uh, right. So it, it becomes very, very difficult, you know, for people uh, to fashion reality uh, within viable and re reasonable, you know, manners that, that actually work, you know, functionally, that, that actually help them to, to live a satisfactory life in common, you know, if, if they violate these cardinal fallacies. But within the parameters of those cardinal fallacies is all sorts of different philosophical perspectives. Uh, so logic-based therapy does have some limits. I mean, you can't be contradictory, have a contradictory philosophy. You can't have a philosophy that, um, that violates um, RAM thinking, for instance, mm. because that's not conducive to metaphysical security. Mm. Um, so uh, there's, you know, there's constructivism, but there's also you know, a kind of, of um, I don't want to say platonic, but uh, mm. there's, there's certain parameters within which, you know, that operates. And, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to, to mention that it's not about the idea that there is one good logic. Because I imagine, imagine Aristotle's being a logic-based therapist and receiving Hegel uh, in his practice, right? And Hegel will say, will start to say, oh, I'm, it's strange I'm having these ideas of opposites uh, uniting themselves and, and, and the negative and the positive and A, A and non-A uh, being identical sometimes. And Aristotle will say, no, that's not possible. It's a fallacy, right? So that's not about that. It's about allowing people to, uh, to not think different things without being conscious of it that actually contradict themselves which leads to actually consequences that are very real right acts that are uh, very real and and that can be damageable but there's something that then one might ask okay so what's the goal of all that what's 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 the telos of philosophical health and uh, and in in psychology there is often this concept of self-actualization, right? And you write in your paper something that I found really interesting. You write, self-actualization in the metaphysical sense of a fully self-actualized being is not possible for human beings. A category, a category of ontology the ancients have granted to an infinite being, God. Right. So can you say more about that? Because that's, I mean, people who want to attain self-actualization, either they might say, mm, too bad, or they might say, okay, then I need to become a god, which is what some people today uh, seem to uh, wanting to define as the next horizon of humanity, right? Uh, this sort of a transhumanist uh, ideal of turning us into more and more uh, powerful beings or, or, or the beliefs in uh, some sort of magical thinking where you would, you would actually actualize uh, everything you want, usually very material things. Um, so can you say more about this? Is it, because it seems almost contradictory also to ancient Greek thought, I mean, partly only contradictory in the sense that they did believe that we can, they, of course, they didn't believe that humans can be gods, because that would be Ibris, but they did believe that through uh, the exercise of philosophy, we could get closer to the divine, right? That's, I mean, the major figure of that kind of thinking is Plotinus, but you have that in Plato, and even in Aristotle with this idea of Eudaimonia, and precisely this famous uh, eudaimonic inspiration, which was also seen in Descartes, is etymol etymologically the fact that you are talking with the spirits, you're talking with your personal channel that allows you to communicate with the divine. Uh, but so what's the telos then if it's not self-actualization or is it do you mean that it's only partial self-actualization how do you articulate that 
Well, you know, it, it, in a sense, um, logic-based therapy is, is, is Aristotelian uh, in, in the idea that it's the virtues, you know, that you're aiming at. There's different ways, different philosophical constructs of those virtues, different ways of interpreting, you know, those, those virtues. But ultimately, the goal is to be uh, more, uh, well, in general, more metaphysically secure, and that means self-accepting. Uh, it, it, it means um, feeling comfortable with, um, you know, the fact that there's, you know, risk in, in the world and that um, there's, you're not always going to be successful about what you do and so forth. Th these, you know, these are, you know, virtues of courage uh, involve being willing, you know, to take reasonable risks. Uh, so, you know, these virtues come together, you know, and uh, there's, you know, there's a, a leaven of these virtues um, and, and including, uh, you know, uh, the, the idea that's crowning virtue of metaphysical security under which all these others, you know, are included. So the telos, uh, if you want to speak, you know, in an Aristotelian sort of way, the telos of, uh, of, of logic-based therapy is, is, you know, the, the virtues that are implied by metaphysical security. Uh, and, you know, it, this, this is um, definitely something that it doesn't, it, it built into it is, is, is realizing that you're not going to be 100% self-actualized. And in fact, if you demand that you be 100% self-actualized or you actually think you are, uh, then you're <laughs> defying some cardinal fallacies you know, of, of logic-based therapy, of which, which wishful thinking is, is one of them. Mm. Right. And I mean, yeah, I'd probably we could, we could say that death, once you're dead, maybe you're, you're fully self-actualized. Um, but that's interesting. Uh, speaking about uh, uh, metaphysics, uh, there is another concept that is less famous is uh, self-transcendence. Uh, and self-transcendence is usually defined as the capacity to um, put the self, the ego aside in order to serve a higher ideal. Uh, and so I think that if we look at the uh, ancient Greek philosophy, including Aristotle, I think that that's what they're saying in a way. They're saying that the good life is the life that serves a, a grand idea, whether that's justice, whether that's the good, whether that's um, the, the city, uh, uh, the, the, the political equilibrium. Uh, and of course, they might have, uh, some of them, uh, probably more Aristotle than Plato, they might have uh, takes at it that are sort of moderate, right? When Aristotle talks about the golden mean, there is an idea of moderation there. So you don't want completely to lose yourself uh, into a group or an ideology. Uh, but you were talking about narcissism. You want to be capable of not only being in a me mode, uh, the domestic, uh, what Anna Arendt called the, the domestic mode. So what, how do you balance that, uh, your sort of, um, uh, your, your care for, uh, let's say your prudence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, idealism? And the fact that I, mean, I believe, and in my practice, I, I tend to tell people that um, it's okay to have a, a grand ideal in life, with all the caveat that we mentioned, right? Uh, of course, the form of pragmatism, and but precisely, if we have a process uh, philosophy look on that ideal, we know that there is a it's a creative flow in which means that actually we don't want to actualize it we don't want to think that we have actualized it too fast because uh, first of all it would be wrong and secondly 
what then? Uh, but we also want uh, perhaps to keep the, I mean, the, the, the claim that this is possible because otherwise we might fall into a form of fatalism perhaps the idea that you know we are imperfect therefore it's okay to eat chips in front of net netflix every night uh and you know because we are just mortal uh so so is, isn't that a, a thin line a thin equilibrium let's talk perhaps let's answer these questions perhaps with our cases and practices because we have the the chance right to to discuss with real human beings with who have real problems in real lives and 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 so how how do you help people like that who can be idealists uh and and who who perhaps shouldn't give up on their ideal right yeah i i, I don't think that people should give up on their ideals um because that's what's exciting, you know, and to, I, I often use a metaphor of shooting for the stars, but not demanding that you land on them. And so you can, you can certainly have your ideals, but just don't demand, you know, that you satisfy them. And then there's no contradiction any longer in your system. And uh, to give you actual real examples, uh, for instance, athletes are, 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 are great examples of uh, this idea that I, I must be perfect when I go out on the field, I must perform perfectly. And as a result of that, um, they, they think that, you know, that's what, you know, that, that, that aspirational idea of demanding perfection somehow is what makes them perform well on the field. And many of them do, you know, they're perfectionists. And I've had students and clients who have you know, had this this issue. They've they've lived their lives in in a state of, of great stress and tension, but they think that that's what makes them successful. So it's the ideal they'll argue that you know of, of, of being perfect is what makes them perform at their best. But there's a, a mistake in there, and the mistake is the distinction between you know, actually having the ideal and shooting for excellence, striving for excellence in what you do and demanding that you achieve perfection. And so when you go out on the field, I'm gonna do the best I can conceivably do. I'm going to, and if you wanna say, I'm going to do perfectly, okay? I'm gonna perform perfectly. Um, but at the end of the day, when you don't fall, when you fall short, as you inevitably will, you don't say, well, I, I, I didn't do what I must do, and therefore I'm um, a failure. Uh, because it's at that juncture where what you do is you create you know, unnecessary stress. So shoot for the stars, but just don't turn that desire into that demand. Because as soon as you turn that desire into the demand, you create that introceptive feeling, you know that that works against you. It, it's a discomfort, and so the, such individuals will feel those who who demand perfection uh, will even when they're doing well, they think to themselves, well, what happens if if the next time I go out and 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 don't do as well, and so they live in this state of of stress. And, and it's actually the stress that can create greater problems uh, than um, not having that stress. And, and this is me, me, musicians too. A musician that goes out and says, I'm gonna give my, you know, I'm gonna perform like the greatest virtuoso in, in the universe. Mm -hmm. and, and goes out there and, 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 and does it and uh, maybe fumbles, but while they're fumbling, they're not saying I must perform right. perfectly. Uh, because as soon as you, you make that demand, you create greater stress. Mm. And um, as, a, as a young musician, I can remember myself doing a classical guitar concert and I went out there and <laughs> I was demanding perfection. 
<laughs> and when I went out there, um, I, I was I was performing uh, a canary jig. Uh, oh no, no, it was, it was called lagrima. That's what it was. Literally teardrops. And 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 uh, and and suddenly I, I I discovered that I was repeating the same. <laughs> The same part right. you know, that I twice, yeah. <laughs> and, it was uh, so oh, no, perfect oh, no. that it, you entered the loop, right? Yeah, yeah. And then I'm looking at my, uh, then I go down at the strings, and and you know, each of the six strings started to appear like they were, like the, the gullies between them were like <laughs> okay. miles apart. <laughs> right. Uh, that was your psychotic episode. <laughs> I got through it, but. But it, it was it was very 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 difficult mm -hmm. uh, to to get through it, and the stress that I I had it affected you know my performance. Mm -hmm. Actually, I would have done better right. without that perfectionism. Yeah, it, I, that resonates uh, because I see there a distinction between perfection and mastery, and I often uh, tell my counselors that I want to help them become masters. But a master is not someone, indeed, that compares uh, himself or herself. Uh, you were talking about sports and that very, indeed, uh, dangerous view of perfection as a comparative uh, skill. Mastery is, uh, is, on the contrary, the, the, the development of your own singularity, uh, of what you uh, can uh, do in such that is actually on the very equilibrium between effort and self-expression, right? The, uh, in Taoism, it's called uh, Wu Wei, this, this sort of effortless action. It's not that you're just sitting there because nothing will come out of the guitar. Is that you have enough faith in the fact that, of course, you practice, you have your, your technique, you, you need to work. But then at some point, you also focused on what is most important, which is authenticity, this self-expression. And you talk about authenticity in your paper. And I think that's one virtue, a very simple virtue, if people are asking, but what is this about? <laughs> what are they talking about? Well, honesty right? Uh, intellectual honesty and the courage to, to be honest with yourself and with the others uh, without necessarily, of course, going about and, and offending people, but, you know, just not being scared. Uh, I ask often to my counselors, uh, so I talk about Hegel and the, uh, the dialectic of the master and the slave. And I asked my counselors, okay, so you have these two people and they are equal in the beginning. And after a while, one becomes the master, one becomes the slave. And I asked, what do you think? Why do you think that happens? And that leads to a series of interesting conversations. Uh, in, in, in my view, this happens because, and that, I mean, that's Hegel's view. Uh, the master is not afraid to die while the slave is afraid to die. The master is not afraid to die for what? For, for what he believes in, for his authenticity, his or hers authenticity. And, and that seems like a very old way of thinking, but I don't think it is. I think it's something that is very, uh, very uh, contemporary, very uh, uh, fit for our times, is that mastery is not about being the best because that doesn't make sense. And indeed, that leads to a lot of suffering. It's about being the best version of yourself, but such that it respects uh, what I sometimes call your eudaimonia, uh, which is a slightly different from eudaimonia, um, right? Eudynamia, sorry. Eudynamia, which is good dynamics, the good possibility. The fact that you keep enough uh, reserves or, or energy to, to do something different next time. So you don't want to fully actualize. You actually actualize, but by staying this creative potentiality, that is what gives you also the, the flow and, 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 uh, 
the um, the joie de vivre. I think that's a very a very uh, important point that you're that you're making. That you you move towards your goals in an authentic way, and that that authenticity may be more important than what you achieve, because what you do is this 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 candor and honesty with oneself, not living as Sartre would say, in bad faith. Uh, that you you know you accept your you know the your limits and and you attempt to achieve whatever is in your power in an authentic way and i think that's that's, that's an excellent an excellent point uh, about you know how to make peace <laughs> with imperfection <laughs> do it authentically <laughs> indeed and i think that's uh i think that's a good uh, uh conclusion for our conversation which might not be the last one because it's it's a, a very uh, deep topic and and we certainly are passionate about it but i hope this gave to the people who are watching us and listening to us a certain idea of what what do we do why do we want to uh, help people uh, have more meaningful lives and and satisfactory ones through philosophy, which might seem like a very uh, strange idea for now. But I always say, you know, take physical health. Uh, it looks some, like something very natural today, right? But it was invented in the 18th century uh, with gymnastics, etc. The Greeks had it a bit, but then it was forgotten. Uh, and now it's considered, you know, in the 18th century, it was a luxury for a happy few who could afford gymnastics and and now it's a necessity for all. Take psychological health. It also started a little bit later, end of the 19th century, early 20th century. It was a luxury for a happy few in Vienna, those who could uh, afford uh, meeting Freud. And now it's considered a necessity for all. So I wish that today philosophical health, which is, we could say, a luxury for the happy few, although. Uh, you and I, we work with people, you in India, me sometimes in Bangladesh. So we, we're really trying to open this democratically and globally. But still, it's, it's a minority of people who know about it. And let's hope that by the end of this century, it can be uh, a non-normative necessity for all. It is growing uh, quite um, well uh, throughout the world. And... Um... Uh, in uh, 1991, I founded the National Philosophical Counseling Association. And when we started our training program, you know, there were very few people who were trained in philosophical counseling, let alone logic-based therapy. But now we're training people all over the world regularly. So if, if uh, uh, those listening are, are interested in, you know, looking further into that, um, uh, you can Google National Philosophical Counseling Association, and it discusses uh, the views of the Association on Philosophical Counseling on their website, as well as uh, provides um, information about um, philosophical counseling, uh, getting getting trained in philosophical counseling, and 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 the like. So um, that's a that's an opportunity uh, that's constantly growing. I've I've seen it uh, expand leaps and bounds all over over the years. Indeed. And for those of you who would like to know more about the, uh, the idea of philosophical health and the various networks and various methodologies that are used, not only um, uh, LBT or microelectics, but others, you can simply write also philosophical.health and, and uh, you will indeed get a, a glimpse that this is now a, an international phenomenon. So, Elliot, many thanks. I will stop the recording now. Wonderful.